My name is Mark Trexler. I'm with the Climatographers, a climate risk consulting firm. I've spent the last 28 years working on climate change issues in, in a wide variety of capacities, and currently I'm focused on the question of how do you think about, communicate, implement climate risk strategies. When, when we think about climate risk and business risk, we, we really have a disconnect because business risk tends to be thinking anywhere from three months to two years out into the future. You know, five years is long-term planning for most business risk management. And businesses have enterprise risk management, they have operational risk management, continuity risk management, supply chain risk management, all sorts of sort of risk management frames that businesses use. But they're all short-term. Very little thinking goes on, you know, two years, three years, five years. Virtually no thinking goes on 10 years, 15, 20 years out. And so when we think about climate risk, the tools that we normally use for business risk analysis just don't really work because climate risk, you can't talk about climate risk in a three month, one year, two year time frame. Climate risk by definition is, is sure, there's a current aspect to it and there's a near term aspect to it. But you have to be thinking midterm and long term when it comes to, to climate risk and those just aren't the kinds of risk tools and it's not the kind of risk thinking that businesses are used to using. When I've worked with companies on, on risk issues, what I found over the years is that scenario planning and thinking about risk scenarios around climate risk is, is really the most effective way to help companies engage on this issue. Because you know, for operational risk, they know what the risks potentially are. Or for, for supply chain risk, there's a storm and suddenly they can't get what they need to their distributors or something like that. They, they know what they're trying to manage from a risk perspective. When it comes to climate change and sort of a longer term risk issue, what that means is that you're introducing a lot more uncertainty into the question of, well, what exactly is it that we're trying to prepare for? And when you get you know, two years, three years, five years, 10 years out into the future, that uncertainty basically magnifies. It expands, expands, expands. And so you really have to start thinking about, well, what is the scenario that we have in mind for climate risk, for climate change, for climate policy? What is the scenario that we want to manage risk for, that we want to be hedged against in terms of what we do today to control our risk under alternative future scenarios? And that, that's why scenario planning is so important when it comes to climate risk at a business level. And scenario planning is something that most companies don't really do. Uh, some do, some sectors do, certainly. But most companies don't do it, and many companies that do scenario planning don't really do it the way you need to do it to manage a topic like climate risk. When we think about scenario planning, one of the interesting problems we have is that for, for humans, it's very difficult to think about futures that are that are very different from the present. We, we just inherently tend to extrapolate the, fu the, the current situation and our current circumstances into the future. It's just the way our minds work. When it comes to scenario planning, where you're consciously trying to, to deal with uncertainty and consciously trying to make sure you're covering your bases given alternative outcomes, you can't trust that simple extrapolation of the present into the future. I mean, just for an example, when, when oil is, is $25 a barrel, and was years ago, the idea that it would get to $120 a barrel was just nonsensical. I mean, that was ridiculous. When oil was $125 a barrel, the idea it would go back to 20 was just nonsensical. It was ridiculous, and, and nobody thought that way. When we're thinking about climate risk and thinking about future scenarios, especially if we're looking 5, 10, 15 years out, things can shift pretty dramatically. The public perceptions can shift, public policies can shift, the climate itself can shift in various ways with, with sort of relatively sudden shifts. And so that's why scenario planning becomes so important and you need to sort of define what those scenarios are 
and bound your risks through scenario planning. Uh, you can't trust yourself to just think about the future and come up with the right future because that's just not the way our minds work. That's what scenario planning is so valuable for. It forces you to open up your mind and to think about the future in a different way and that's critical to climate risk management. Well, it's certainly the case that, that the companies thinking about climate risk tend to be the larger corporations because they have the people, they have the departments, they have strategic planners, they have a risk officer. Uh, they're in a much better position to think about climate risk issues. Smaller companies aren't. I mean, smaller companies just don't have those people, and so they tend not to be thinking about climate risk in, in at all the same way that a big company does. The problem is, is that small companies are much more fragile. And so, in many respects, small companies are much more sensitive to some of the climate risks that we're talking about in terms of climate-inspired extreme events, trends that, that really influence their supply chains. Small companies often cannot recover from even a modest supply chain disruption. So if you have even a modest supply chain interruption, a particularly violent storm or, or something else from the, that might be influenced, worsened, whatever, by climate change, small companies are simply a lot more vulnerable to those events. But they're also the companies that just aren't thinking about climate risk and, and how climate risk might present itself. They're also more vulnerable to a lot of the potential policy measures that might come out. I mean, if we get significant carbon pricing at some point, small companies are, are not going to be anywhere near as well prepared or able to adapt as larger companies. So, so sure, it's much harder for smaller companies to grapple with this issue, but in many respects, they're a lot more vulnerable to the problem. When we think about corporate climate risk, one of the interesting things is that it's really hard to know or to pinpoint in advance where the interest is coming from, or the direction is coming from, or the leadership is coming from within a company. To date, it's mostly, it's often come from the CEO. It comes from you know, the CEO being exposed to, to an idea or what his colleagues or her colleagues are thinking about. So it comes from the top down. Uh, because there is no mandate still to really consider climate risk. In, in, most, in most respects. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about it, but it's really not factored into the official risk management structures of companies. Some companies, it's the board of directors that have a risk committee, and that's sort of where it sits. In other cases, it might be the, the head of the environment department or the, the, the environmental health and safety department because there's no place else to put it, or the chief sustainability officer or any, any number of places it might sit in terms of climate risk management. The problem there is that climate risk is one of those issues that, that has to engage the company as a whole. You can't just send one person off to think about climate risk, develop a strategy, implement that strategy. That's not what climate risk is about. So you have to have the CFO involved. You have to have the, the supply chain people involved. You, you really have to have the company involved. And that makes it a lot more complicated, more difficult, and unless you're careful, a lot more expensive to, to do. And, and so that's one of the real barriers to, as to why we don't see more sort of effective climate risk management within a lot of companies. When we think about risk, risk and opportunity really are the flip side of the same coin. So there's a lot of argument out there as to, you know, is this a risk? Is this an opportunity? Should we be presenting it as a risk? Should we be presenting it as an opportunity? And you, you don't have to have that argument in the sense that for, for some companies, this is obviously much more of a risk than an opportunity. For some companies, this is obviously much more of an opportunity than a risk. For a lot of companies, risk and opportunity are almost hard to separate from each other. Because if you manage the risk, that becomes an opportunity. So you know, in, in some ways, it's, it's a pointless discussion to have if you're, if you're thinking about risk and opportunity the right way. You know, in some cases, it might be developing a technology that you might not otherwise have decided to develop 
but thinking about it from a climate perspective and how markets are likely to evolve, low carbon transition markets, et cetera, there's a, going to be a bigger market for that technology than would otherwise have been the case. So developing that new technology is a, a, an economic opportunity, but is also hedging your risk on, on other technologies that you might have. So this, this whole risk opportunity debate uh, and you should never talk about risk, you should only present it as an opportunity, or vice versa, is just not very helpful. The climate web actually has a very specific beginning. I've, I've had a long-standing interest in knowledge management and, and how can we use information better for decision making and for decision making support. But about five years ago, I was at a conference in New York and watching the authors of a, of a very interesting book called Influencer, The Power to Change, anything. And the authors were talking about their research into human decision making. And by, in, by implication, how can you influence human decision making? And what they were saying was that when we make a decision, and it really doesn't matter what the decision is, any decision, no matter how minor, how major, we're asking ourselves the same two questions. Is it worth it to me to engage on this issue and to make this decision? And Will this decision make any difference? Can I do it? So, and I, I translate these two points into the is it worth it, can I do it questions. And I realized just sitting there watching these, the, the authors of, this, of the book talk about this, that when it comes to climate change, we as sort of the consulting community, the environmental community, have done a terrible job of answering those two questions for people. We tend to go in and explain with our 20 PowerPoint slides our epiphany on climate change, on why climate change is an emergency, or why energy efficiency is the answer, or anything. I mean, many, many variations on the theme. But we go and explain our epiphany, our thinking, our unassailable logic. And we expect the audience to walk out of the room with an epiphany. And, and it turns out that's just not the way the human mind works. It, you, unless you present the information that allows them to, to answer these two questions, is it worth it, can I do it? And you have to let them answer those two questions roughly at the same time. You can't, you can't tell them the is it worth it part and then two weeks later come back with the can I do it part because they'll have already forgotten the is it worth it part. So as I, as I was sitting there, it just occurred to me, what if we tried to use knowledge management tools uh, and in this case, the climate web is what it's turned into, but, but the software that the, knowledge, that the climate web uses. What if we tried to use knowledge management tools to help people answer those two questions for themselves? Is it worth it? Can I do it? The real challenge is that each person needs different information to answer the is it worth it, can I do it questions. And so even though there's an infinity of information out there on climate change, on pretty much anything to do with climate change, that information just doesn't get to the people who are trying to answer those two questions for themselves, or at least the right information doesn't get to those people. The climate web is an effort to, to make it possible for people to find the is it worth it, can I do it information from sort of this infinity of climate information that's sitting out there. And so it was, it was literally watching that presentation that led us to say, let's try and build the climate web to help solve that problem. So over the last five years, we've input and organized and curated a very large amount of climate information into the climate web. We're not talking just climate science here. We're talking the, all, the literature of the psychology of how do you communicate climate change, how, the, the psychology of how do we perceive risk. How do businesses manage risk? Uh, how is the ethics community thinking about climate change? How is the activism community thinking about climate change? Uh, all of this is in the climate web. And so what we do is basically pull in uh, reports, books, blogs, news reports, all sorts of stuff. And we're up to about 13,000 sort of specific documents, reports, and 15,000 news stories, blogs, website links. We also include websites on all sorts of stuff and individuals who's working on different topics. So you have this sort of mass of information 
But the climate web isn't intended just to be a filing cabinet, no matter how big a filing cabinet it, it, it is. That's not really the goal. The goal is to then extract sort of key tables, key figures, the best thinking, the best ideas, link all of that together so that you don't need to know what report you're looking for. You need to know what question you have. And then the climate web, ideally, and, and obviously this is a work in progress, it can never be finished, but ideally what we will have done in the climate web is organize some of the best ideas, thinking, graphics, tables, figures, reports, sources, news stories, put it all into a package for you and so that you can then access that, that knowledge. And hopefully you will find actionable knowledge there that you simply wouldn't find if you Google a search term, come up with 25 million hits in a quarter of a second. You only look at the first two things that show up on your screen. They probably aren't the best things to be looking at to answer that question. That's what we're trying to get at with, with the climate web, is, is how do we organize link information in ways that people can actually find it and use it. One of the really interesting things that we're doing right now is, is sort of dashboards where we're organizing for business risk or for carbon pricing. Dashboards that, that summarize the entire topic of carbon pricing and what's going on with carbon pricing, what are the key issues with carbon pricing, on one screen with pop-ups that you can read, sort of slides that summarize key, key points. And so somebody can sort of get an overview of the entire topic in 10 minutes. If they want, they can dive in much deeper and, and read lots of reports and blogs and discussions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't have to. They can, through the dashboard, get a very quick sense of what that is and track how the topic is, is evolving and changing over time. So the climate web is trying to be, in some weird sense, it's trying to be all things to all people, which, which is not always a great idea. But in this case, once you have this, this collection of information, this, this almost infinite amount of curated information, you can organize it in many, many different ways for different people trying to solve different pe questions or solve different problems. And that, that's the beauty of the software that we're using, the brain software, because it makes it really flexible and really easy to reorganize information in a way that, that allows a specific person to find something. 